Okay, welcome again to another question time. Now you have <coughs> filled your tummies with delicious food. Now is the time to fill your mind with delicious Dhamma food. But Ajahn Chah said, food for the heart. Very good. Uh, just a quick word of um, advice on meditation. Sometimes people have asked in the interviews, they say, well, are you supposed to interrupt silence sometimes to give some advice to yourself? And very often it's okay every now and again just to give a little nudge to one's meditation, which means you interrupt the silence ever so softly just to actually to give a bit of advice. Little things like just saying, calm, calm, calm. Or just telling yourself, just to let go, let go, let go. Or just saying, relax, relax, relax. What we really mean there is that it's okay to disturb the silence in a small way, as long as it's with a bit of directed thought. Just to give yourself a bit of a nudge towards peace. Where we say we're not supposed to have any thinking, we're supposed to be still, it means where we go on and on and on and on, yak, 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 yak. That's what we really need to abandon. So we have more silence. But you don't need to have 100% silence in your meditation. Every now and again you can just say a couple of words. Just to guide the mind even deeper. Sometime I gave the simile of the taxi driver. The simile of the taxi driver is this. When you finish this retreat, some of you are going to Singapore, I'm going to Penang. Those of you going to Singapore might order a taxi. And you say to the taxi driver, take me to KLIA. And you say, I want to go not too fast, not too slow. Just about sort of maybe 90 kilometers an hour, 100 kilometers an hour. Make sure, because I'm a Buddhist, if you see any cars want to come in front of you, please allow them in first, because I'm a Buddhist. Please be compassionate. Don't talk too much. Switch down your radio. <coughs> and if you keep on talking like that, that taxi driver, before you get out of the gate, will throw you out. <laughs> he said, look, you sit in the back, I'll do the driving. Now, of course, I think you've got the simile there. All you need to do to the taxi driver, which is your mind, just give it a few little hints of what it wants, to, what you need to do. Just like the taxi driver, he knows how to get to the airport. He knows the best way. He knows how to drive. That's his business. So you just tell him, take me to KLIA, and then you sit in the backs and relax and allow the orders to be completed. In the same way, you tell your mind, mind, please watch the breath, and you leave it alone so the mind has got the time to watch the breath. You don't say, come on mind, watch the breath. I'm waiting, watch the breath. Come on, you better watch the breath. Why aren't you doing what you're told? Watch the breath. Your poor old mind is working, it takes time. So give the instructions, be quiet, shh, and give the mind all the time it needs to complete your task. It is programming the mindfulness, and often the reason why programming the mindfulness doesn't work is because we interrupt and give more instructions when the poor mind hasn't got time to complete the instructions it's already received. So, <coughs> during the meditation, you can always interrupt the, the silence a few times just by programming the mind, just calm, calm, calm. But don't do more than that. You can say, calm, 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 come on, get calm. Look, I'm telling you, get calm. Calm, you stupid mind. <laughs> then no wonder your mind rebels and you never get peaceful at all. Just like the taxi driver, they throw you out of the car. Okay, that's another bit about nudging the meditation. Now we come to the questions. Dear Ajahn, can a lay person, i.e. not a monk or a nun, sometimes monks and nuns are lay person, because you know my definition of lay people? People who lay around. <laughs> and some monks and nuns are really lazy. So they lay about monks and nuns, so they're really like lay people, because they lay around. Can a lay person achieve enlightenment? This is to be known, each person for themselves. Try, give it a try, and see if you can prove that for yourself. If I tell you, will you believe me? If you believe everything you're told, you're gullible. And if you won't believe me, it's a waste of time me telling you. <laughs> so the point is, yes, they can become enlightened. But if you become enlightened, it has consequences. 
There was one of my lay disciples, he was practicing in Sri Lanka amongst his tradition. And it was a bit of a strange tradition, but the teacher was telling him he was getting all these stages of enlightenment. It wasn't really true, but he believed it at the time. And so he rang up his wife back in Perth saying, oh, the teacher just told me I'm a stream winner. That's really, really good. And his wife was very impressed. A few days later, he said, the teacher has told me now I'm a once returner. That's really, really good. A few days later, he rang up and said, now I'm a, he, said, he was a doctor. He said, now I'm a non-returner. <laughs> and at that, his wife got really upset. He said, stop it. Please stop there, come home, work, pay off the mortgage before you become a fully line <laughs> I don't want you to leave the world yet, we've got too many debts. <laughs> but if you do become an enlightened being, even a non-returner has consequences. Just naturally, you have to keep the five precepts, not because you try, you can't do anything else. Now you are sort of just a noble being, and you act nobly, it's your character. You can't do anything about it. You have to keep precepts. So if you become an anagami, a non-returner, you will not be able to have sex with your husband or with your wife. It has consequences. That's why they say, stop it. <laughs> Don't go further, they say. You won't be interested in money anymore. You're not interested at all. Because just like that Gatikara, who, I told you that story of Gatikara a few days ago. He was an anagami, he wore white, he was not into jewellery or fashionable clothes. The eight precepts of like not wearing jewellery or adornments becomes natural. You just can't do it, you can't put on adornments, it doesn't make sense to you. So, that that's part of being an anagami. You're not interested in money, he just made his pots live so simply and put his pots on, say, on barter. Leave some rice if you want. Take a pot if you want. But it was not buying and selling. It's very difficult to do business if you're on an anagam. In fact, it's impossible. So there's consequences to that. This is one other lay lady who was an anagami. And she said there was some misunderstanding. The king's troops came to arrest her son. They actually got the wrong person, but they killed the son in front of her. They executed him. She was a non returner She said, it was amazing. It was wonderful. Even though that was my son, who I'd brought up for so many years, even though he was innocent, when the king's soldiers executed him in front of me, I never felt any remorse, any anger, anything at all. I was so peaceful. He said, that's called detachment. That's what happens when you're an anagami. It's not your son anymore. It's just a being you look after. There's no attachment, no me, no mine. So it's a powerful, this is actually how you can recognize who is an anagami non-returner who is an arahat. And if you see that somebody, like this a monk, and his mother dies or his father dies and he gets all upset, he's obviously not understood the Dhamma. They're not really the enlightened one yet. So there's consequences to enlightenment. But of course the major consequence is you're happy, you're peaceful, no more suffering. So you can become an enlightened person, but do you really want to? Do you want to give up your music and all your food and all your nice little things, your nice little treats? After a while you say, yes I do. So yes, you can, the doors of the deathless are open even to you. But I'll talk about enlightenment more tonight. Ajahn, you mentioned that meditation is good karma. What if the meditation state is not great and merely struggling at watching the breath? Does it still contribute to good karma? Is the karma measured by the state of one's meditation sitting? Thank you and sadhu. Now you've probably heard this teaching before that karma is intention. That's the most important thing about karma. So if you have the intention to actually to say give a donation to the temple but somehow or other it just disappears, someone robs the donation box. Actually I haven't seen where all those young powers have gone. But it doesn't matter, because you had the good intention, and so it's, it's always you've got the merit already. It's the same when you're sitting, you've got the good intention to watch the breath. But where's the breath gone? I don't know, someone's taken it. <laughs> Just like the young pals, who cares? But they haven't really stolen it. They've taken it away to actually to change it into Australian dollars, and then they can send a cheque. I told you, the cheque's in the mail. 
So you have made good karma, just your intention, your intention of meditating, like your intention of giving dana. That is most important. So you made good karma just by your intention to sit on this cushion. Whether you achieve it or not, that's, that adds to the good karma, but you've already made huge good karma already, just by your intention to try and watch the breath, to try and let go. So you're already way ahead. You don't lose anything. That's why I said there's no such thing as a bad meditation. There's only no meditation. That's bad. We don't even bother to sit down. If you sit down, you walk that by itself already. It's huge good karma. So well done. You've all made lots and lots and lots of good karma. Dear Ajahn, apart from Malaysia and Singapore, what other countries do you spread the Dharma? It is believed that the West is pumping millions into third world countries, e.g. Mongolia, to Christian organizations. Are Buddhists too complacent? There is so much to be done. Thank you with Metta. I am teaching in many countries. I teach in United States, in Europe, in Czechoslovakia, in Alaska, even in Africa. Via the internet. <laughs> it's a wonderful tool. I can just sit in my monastery and give a talk. And you give one talk, it goes all over the world. Isn't that marvelous? And that's actually, it's marvelous to do this. We don't need to pump millions into building big monasteries and big churches or uh, meditation centers are accepted. And <laughs> <laughs> I just thought about that once I started. I thought, uh-oh, you better stop. <laughs> but sometimes I've seen this, especially in Thailand. It's these huge monasteries and temples and no one goes in there. Just like these huge churches in the West. They're empty. What's the use of a big temple when there's nobody actually goes inside of it? So it's important, one of my sayings, which I always keep in mind as being an abbot of a monastery, people are more important than things. So it's not the temple that's important, it's the people who go inside of it. In fact, that was the original meaning of the word church. A church in the English language was never a building. It was a people, it was a community. That's what the church actually meant not the bricks and mortar and the steeple and whatever, it was the people. So to build churches in the ancient times was to build communities. And this is actually so important to remember that because sometimes we forget you know, what the, the big building is there for. It's not there for to say just how great our organization is. It's there to serve the needs of the people, the people are the first, they're the church. It's when my monastery in Serpentine was first built. Visitors would come, Australians, and they'd say, where's your monastery? Say, what do you mean? It's here. Say, no, where's the monastery? Where's the building they were asking for? They said, look, a monastery is not a building. A monastery is the people who live here. That's what a monastery is. People. So you may spend millions and millions bringing the, building these huge temples or these huge cathedrals and churches, but that is not spreading religion. It's important, it's the people which count. And the best way, and people realize that, and the best way of doing that is actually putting money into doing things like spreading the Dharma, like printing books and stuff like that. Putting on the internet. Because you know in the future, people won't have time to go to the churches. They won't have time to come to the temples. So you put, take the temple into people's homes. You take the church into their homes. In modern technology, we're already starting some video streaming in Perth. We have, we've tried a couple of experiments, we haven't got to tweak the system soon. Uh, soon that the, you'll be able to see Hajjan Bum or the monks in Perth, just live on the net. So when it's a Friday night talk there, you'll be able to see it in Malaysia. Either live or later on in the evening when you're free. Doesn't that, that make so much sense? So it means when I come to, say, Malaysia, you can also put it on the internet, so my disciples in Perth can see me. And so all over the world we have this great temple called a cyber temple. 
So it's on the internet. So you don't need to spend millions on this big horse. Already this is actually our solution in Perth because those of you who have been to our monasteries in Perth, we've got two monasteries, that's one for the women, the nuns monastery, and one for the monks, it's completely separate, independent. And we have our city centre, close to the CBD. And that's where we're supposed to do all the teaching. And of course, as soon as you build a hall, it's never big enough. It always people cram in there, the, it's crowded every Friday evening. You don't have to advertise, in fact, we are very scared of advertising. Because we did that with a small group in the south, and as soon as you advertise, they had to literally stop people coming in. Five minutes before the talk, they had to close the doors because of fire restrictions. You can't have too many people in the hall. You may know, for those of you in Singapore, I've been banned from teaching in Taipei Buddhist Centre on Lavender Road. The reason is that I gave some talks there and so many people came in, they couldn't keep them out and they're afraid they were breaking the fire regulation laws. So they're scared of having Ajahn Brahm come to their temple now. <laughs> it's not that I teach wrong things, it's I get too many people. And that's happening in Perth as well. So, the solution, we had two solutions. Let's raise a lot of money, a couple of millions, and build this big hall. Say, no, don't do that. Isn't it much better to put you know, a couple of thousand, that's all, not a couple of million, a couple of thousand, into upgrading the internet provider services. So that way, you can actually, don't need a big hall, because everybody's got a temple on their computer screen. Soon it'll be on their TV, interactive TVs. So, if an evening, you'd have a choice. You can either watch uh, some movie, or you can watch Ajahn Brahm, latest talk from Perth. And that's what will happen. So that's obviously the sign of things to come. So that's actually how we can actually build new things. <coughs> so, we're not complacent. So we do actually uh, pump millions into um, countries, but over the internet. I think it's not just power, it's like wisdom. Sometimes very strong people always lose. It's the wise people are the ones who win. And there's a lot of very wise, compassionate Buddhists around. They don't do things in the old ways sometimes, they do things in the new ways. And that's why, <coughs> sure, that Christian organizations are very wealthy, but they're not making much headway, certainly in the West. The Christian organizations are losing um, converts in Western countries. They're gaining in places like Australia. I read in the newspaper, it was about two, three years ago, uh, when they got all the cens census from the European Union in Europe, it was the first time in, I don't know, 1800 years that now there was less than 50% of Europeans, less, were Christians. So it's mostly a non-Christian um, organization, Europe. Now the heart of Christianity has now turned away from Christianity, which is why in the European Union, when they started their constitution, despite all of the power and the influence of the Pope, they would not put a reference to Christianity in the preamble of the European Union Constitution. So it's actually going away. So it's good to support your temples, it's good to give your donations, it's good to support, but put your support in the right way. So it's giving teachings is the best way to support Buddhism. Dear Ajahn, please forgive me as I have to ask this question to clear my doubt. It is said, Dharma is free. If it's so, if it's so, why is the book, Opening the Door of Your Heart, is on sale? Ah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to change the title of the book. Instead of Opening the Door of Your Heart, Open the Door of Your Wallet. <laughs> <laughs> By doing so, they can they consider those who might not be able to afford, but yet are interested to read this book. You are then you. How would this affect the religion? If it is for donation, I'm sure there are other ways to raise funds. Please clarify. Okay, the reason why that was put as a book for sale is because you know, we've experimented with for many years having books for free distribution, and where do they end up? They end up in the temples. They go no further. Because sometimes there was a, many books for, we did for feed distribution, like Ajahn Chah's books. People would write, where can we get a copy? And we'd actually run out. There wasn't actually, 
the right distribution of the book. And only those and only those people in the know could get a copy or even knew it existed. And I saw all these other books, you know, in the airport bookshops and all these other books which were, you know, Christianity and strange teachings. And I thought, my goodness, why don't we put more books out there for sale? So people at an airport, people browsing the bookshop can actually pick up a book. And the Dalai Lama does that and it's very successful. It's spreading Buddhism in the world. And you have to actually adapt to the, you know, the realities of our world. Most people will not come into a temple. And these days, one of the reasons is they're afraid to come into a temple because they don't know what they're supposed to do, what the etiquette is. And they see all these symbols, am I, am I supposed to chant for Amitabha? What is a chant? What am I supposed to do? You see all these other people taking their shoes off. Am I supposed to take off my shoes here or there? What am I supposed to do? Am I allowed to sit in a chair or should I sit on a, on a, down there? Can I sort of actually shake the hands of a monk or can I just say, hi, guy? <laughs> what am I supposed to do? And because of that, people just get so uptight about coming into temples. So, one of my missions is to take the temple out to the people. Put it on the internet, put it in the bookshops. And the only way you can do that is actually by getting a publisher and the publisher sells the book. Or any, you know that book, the royalties, which I'm supposed to get, which is all goes to our Buddhist society, is I think is, I think for the ones coming to Malaysia here, about 50 cents per book. That's Australian. So that's, what's that about? A ringgit and a half. A ringgit and a half per book, yeah. Because most of it goes in the, the bookshops, the distribution network, the publishers. So you don't, you know, you, the monastery doesn't, or rather our Buddhist center doesn't get much out of that. But the point is there that it does get it out into the bookshops. And you get good results of that. Already, that there's two schools in Perth. One of them is a government school, one is an Anglican school. What is it, St. Mark's Anglican School in Hillary's? The fellow saw it um, reviewed in the newspaper because it was a book for sale. And he bought a copy, he liked it so much, he's reading out about two or three classes in the school, in an Anglican school, a Christian school. That would never have happened if it was a book for feed distribution just in my temple. Even the, the Premier of Western Australia, Dr. Jeff Gallup, because the, like in Malaysia, Australia is made up of states, it's a federation of states. And each um, state has its own legis legislature, its own government, and each actually uh, state is actually quite powerful. The federal government looks after defense and you know, foreign policy, but many of the decisions are actually made by this, each individual states. So he's quite a powerful man. So he got a copy of the book and he wrote back to me saying how much he liked it, a personal letter. And when I saw him a few weeks later, he said, Oh, John Brown, my favorite author, which is very nice. And you're influencing government that way. Apparently, I met uh, his minister for planning, and she said to me, he said, you don't know how much he's been influenced by Buddhism, because in the cabinet meetings, whenever there's an argument, as there will be in politics, the premier, he shuts us all up and says, be quiet, we should be more Buddhist about this. <laughs> <laughs> Which is great. I mean, you actually make an influencer. So in order to influence people, sometimes you have to publish. And my hope, my Christmas, New Year's resolution is this, because the Premier of Western Australia, Dr. Gallup, he's a very close friend of Tony Blair. In fact, he was Tony and Cherry's best man at their wedding. They went to Oxford together. So my hope, he's going to send a copy of my book to Mr. Blair. Mr. Blair's going to read it and give it as a Christmas present to George Bush. <laughs> And that way I'm going to save the world. <laughs> but that wouldn't happen if it was a free distribution book. So that's why we do that. It's, it's marvelous if it can be for free. But then for free things, sometimes they don't actually get out there into the world. Unfortunately, that's, that's the way of the world. We made a compromise there. So like the Tibetan Buddhists do that. So we're going to try and see, see how that works. So please, I apologize if it's on sale. 
We don't get anything out of this. But what we do get, all I get out of that book is a sore hand. The number of copies I've signed. <laughs> but we're trying to get Dharma out there into the world. That's why we said it. Get in the bookshops. Is that okay? Any, I can actually see the other side of the story about setting things, but sometimes you just have to do that. I can't see any other way of doing it. Because we live in a materialist world. And bookshops will never put, you won't see any books in borders for fee distribution. So you have to do that. Next question. Under Buddhism, you are supposed to reduce your attachments to worldly things like relationships and material things. Would marrying and having a family then be against this? Are you creating, taking on more attachments and making it more difficult to practice the path of letting go? How do you reconcile these two seemingly opposites? Not everybody has got the good karma or the intentions or the ability to live a monastic life. And if everybody did become a monk or nun, who would be able to feed me? So we do have, it's always been the case, ever since the time of the Buddha, there will be a section of the Buddhist population, a very small proportion, who become monks and nuns, and other people would become lay Buddhists. And I said, as a lay Buddhist, you can still become enlightened, but it's a little bit more difficult, that's all. So if you are going to get married, you still have to practice a degree of celibacy in marriage. In other words, once you're married and you see a man sees a beautiful girl, you're just like a monk, you can't take her. You've got one woman to look after. So sometimes you may see someone, oh, she's really nice. We have to say no. Just like young monks have to say no, I've got a commitment to the Buddha, Dhamma and the Sangha. So I can't allow that lust to progress. I might lose my precepts. The same as a lay person. You have to say no, you've got a commitment to marriage. So there's also a degree of celibacy in marriage as well. A woman sees a nice guy. No, I'm married. I can't do that. You have to say no. You have to have restraint. So even in marriage you have to practice similar restraint to actually to stop you know, the lust or the greed coming up. In a marriage you're committed to a family. You've got to forget about yourself. It's not me that's important anymore, it's us. So there's a lot of selflessness in a marriage, a lot of giving up. When you have children, my goodness, there's a heap of giving up there. You have to give up your sleep when you look after little babies, when they cry in the middle of the night. There's a lot of detachment happening there. So the marriage and the family, if you know how to use it properly, can be a wonderful spiritual path for you. It's a path of letting go. A selflessness, it's not for you anymore is for the family. And you know that as a man sacrifices, they work really hard, and they don't really do it for themselves, they do it for the children or for the wife. The wife does it for the family. We do it for each other. And that family, if it's a vehicle for selflessness, giving up desire, and you notice how hard it is in a family to give up anger and ill will because you're living close together. And when two things are close together, they rub up against each other, that's called fiction, that's heat, that's anger. It's very easy. I know many people, they had like a working family, the wife went out to work, the husband went out to work, they were quite happy, but when one of them retired or both of them retired, they both lived at home all day, they got on each other's nerves and that was terrible for their relationship. Too close together, too long, you tend to rub up against each other. Fiction is natural. So you have to learn that way, learn how to give up ill will, to be selfless, learn how to forgive in your marriage. What a wonderful path of spirituality it can be, if you know how to make use of it. So you can be married, you can have kids, and you can make it a path, not of attachment, of letting go. You can make it into a path of attachment. My kids, they have to go to university. They have to go to university in the West. My kids, they have to become doctors and engineers. My kids, they're not your kids. You nurture them. You're like the gardener. And a gardener, if it's got a good seed or a bad seed, it doesn't really matter so much about the gardener. Even with a bad seed, you can't do so much. Even with a good seed, you may be the laziest gardener of all. You get a beautiful seed and a beautiful plant comes out of that. So sometimes it's not the parents' success or failure. You can, have, you can be a hopeless parent, 
but have this beautiful son or daughter. I've seen that, I've seen some children, they're amazing, they're just so good, so kind, so intelligent, and their parents are real awful people. I say, wow, what's going on there? It's because they had a beautiful seed, karma from the past. And you've got some children, they've got the most wonderful parents. They're not indulgent, they're disciplined at the right time, they're caring, but their children become monsters. They, sometimes they'd come up to me and say, what did I do which was wrong? So you didn't do anything wrong. You're like the gardener who didn't have a good, good plant, good seed to work with. You did your very best. So that way that our parenthood has to be with detachment. You have to give everything you've got to your kids and then finally let them go. You have to be like the bird who sits on the eggs until you've got a very sore bottom. If you think you get sore sitting in meditation, Think of a bird, they haven't got a soft cushion, they've got these hard, bumpy eggs to sit on. Now that must make your bottom really sore. So any next time you get a sore bottom, just think of the poor birds. <laughs> and not only that, that once the little chicks are hatched, they've got to spend all day finding food for these squawking little monsters. Squawk, squawk, no matter how many worms you put in there, they want more. And that's what you do, you sacrifice so much. But once the birds can fly, the little chicks are hatched, they're grown up and they can fly. At that point, great, mum and dad just go off by themselves. You can fly now, kids, off you go. And they don't even bother again to look after their kids. The kids don't go home on Chinese New Year to <laughs> see, see their parents. You're not bothered with them, you're free now. They don't come back you know, to ask for a loan from the parents. So once you've grown up, the literally the children are thrown out of the nest, now you go and look after yourself. And that's actually, the birds are much wiser than human beings. Sometimes your children are 25, 30, 35, they still haven't got a job, and you will not kick them out. That's not kind for your children. Sometimes giving them a bit of independence is like kicking them out of the nest. Now you strive like I had to. You work like I had to. You make your house like I had to. So that's being kind. But sometimes when we're attached we think, Oh, I can't throw him out of the house. Oh, he's got nowhere to stay. Oh, he might, he might get lonely or he might have nothing to eat. That's just, that's not compassion, that's attachment. Sometimes we have to be wise, compassion. Out of the house, go. One of my disciples, he told me that when his son was dating, he told me he had to come home at a certain time. And one evening he came home, he was supposed to be coming by 1 a.m. By 1 a.m. he wasn't there, but he could see him coming up the, the, the road in his car, he was five minutes late. So the father locked the house completely, and when the son started knocking, trying to get in, he wouldn't open the door. His son had to sleep outside all night. After that, the son never came home late again. Sometimes you have to do that, and be firm, so people know the boundaries. When your children know the boundaries, then they usually behave accordingly. So it can be a wonderful way of uh, having non-attachment, letting go, but also service. Okay? Any questions on that? And of course, I'm the expert on families, never having had one. <laughs> <laughs> Dear Ajahn, my, oh, yeah. My apologies, okay, I did that one already, sorry. With the greatest of respect, oh, oh, could you please read the question slowly so that we can understand what you are reading? Thank you. <laughs> so you're asking if I can read the question slowly, so I will try. <laughs> if you fall asleep because you are bored, it is not my fault. <laughs> Dear Adjo... <laughs> Okay, not that slow. 
I take your point. Thank you. I'm sorry for making a, <laughs> a laugh at this. Dear Ajahn, if we meditate in a group, we are disturbed by the noise of cushion dropping, coughing, etc. If we meditate alone, we're afraid of being alone. Please advise Sadhu. It is a classic case of the fault-finding mind. The fault-finding mind, if I'm alone, I'm lonely. If I'm with someone else, I'm crowded in. If it's, we turn the air conditioners on, it's too cold. If we don't turn them on, it's too hot. If I read it too fast, I can't hear it. If I read it too slow, I fall asleep. True, isn't it? We've got fault finding minds. So the point is that it is good enough. If the cushion drops, that is wonderful, it wakes me up. <laughs> if I meditate alone, it's wonderful, I can have a bit of a rest when I nod off. It's wonderful, whatever happens, have this. This wonderful, uh, not fault finding mind, this mind of gratitude. It's just so wonderful that I can go out there and eat a breakfast and have something to eat, even though it's far, far too much. And I think, wouldn't it be wonderful just, you know, to have just like a piece of toast, one piece of toast and a cup of tea? That's all I would really like. But people bring all this stuff over there. And if I had a fault finding mind, I think, can't you leave me alone? I just want to have a little bit of breakfast. And people hover, it was like this morning, many of you came in, it wasn't a breakfast, it was a photo op. <laughs> <laughs> and even in breakfast, people ask me questions about Dhamma. Imagine that was you from the time you got up in the morning, at least I'm alone in my shower. People don't come in there to ask me questions. <laughs> But I don't have that fault-finding mind. I just have so much gratitude that people are interested enough in Dharma to ask questions. They've got enough faith to come and bring us food, which sometimes they put so much effort into. I don't care if it gives me indigestion. It just, I feel so happy and privileged to be part of this wonderful act of Dharma. It's actually to bring the best out in people, to bring them joy and happiness. Some people get up so early in the morning, and this is their holiday today. They came all this way to feed me. Oh, that's so wonderful. I've got so much gratitude. You've got so much gratitude to your cushion for actually just supporting you. You've got so much gratitude to Fenchen Parker Buddhist Lodge. All the people who donated to actually to build this hall. And all the people who clean it, look after it, the organizers. It's just so wonderful. Thank you so much. Instead of thinking, oh, they could have had, you know, instead of marble, they could have had some of these, this thick carpet which is much softer. They could have had like personal air conditioning. Because you get these little things just over your head. <laughs> and you can actually get the right temperature just for yourself. You could have like a room with an ensuite. Even more than that, get a room with an ensuite and your own personal butler. <laughs> Wouldn't that be wonderful? With room service in the meditation retreat. <laughs> now the point is, you can always find fault if you have a fault-finding mind. So instead of having a fault-finding mind, we're actually so wonderful that a person is actually meditating next to us and trying their best. If they cough, I'm so soft, it's just wonderful that you've actually managed to do so much non-coughing throughout the time you've been on this retreat. I'm so grateful for all those times you haven't dropped the cushion. Thank you so much, little being sitting next to me, my friend in meditation, my companion on the path. So it's impossible to get ill will or hatred. Even when somebody coughs, ah, it's so cute the way you cough. <laughs> <laughs> so the point is that we don't disturb the world, we don't disturb others. We don't disturb life. It's not life disturbs us. It's not the sound of the cushion disturbs our meditation. We disturb the dropping cushion. We disturb the cough, that's all. So this is what happens. If you've got a fault-finding mind, wherever you are, it's not good enough. Even in jhana, if you've got a fault-finding mind, 
only second jhana. When can I get into third jhana? <laughs> Some people like that, you know. <laughs> Some people like that, you know. Request for CDs. Oh, this is a CD request. Must be in the wrong box. But it's so wonderful that you wrote this anyway. I'm not going to find fault with you for putting it in the wrong box. <laughs> then Ajahn, if one has superpower consciousness and psychic powers follows, will this not lead one astray with self-conceit, egoism and become wayward? Can you please comment? Sada and thank you, Venma Ajahn. Do you think I know who wrote that question? <laughs> no, but... If you have superpower mindfulness and you start having conceit, you will not be able to maintain that superpower mindfulness. Actually, conceit, I should have mentioned this yesterday in the point of the talk of Anatta, but conceit in Buddhism is very powerful, very beautiful. It's the three conceits. The first is what most Western people think is conceit, it means I think I'm better than you. That's only the first type of conceit. The second type of conceit is thinking I'm worse than somebody else. In Buddhism, that's the same as thinking you're better, thinking you're worse. That too is being conceited. When I heard that, that's brilliant, how right the Buddha was. Sometimes we only think that being better is conceit, but thinking we're worse is also conceit. Have you ever had that inferiority complex, either at school or in this meditation retreat, you see the person sitting next to you, they sit so straight. They sit there for hours. <laughs> it's not fair. And that's conceit, thinking you're worse. And also the third conceit is thinking one is equal. Wow, that really blew me away. All this thing about all beings are created equal. That, according to Buddhism, is conceit. Brilliant. Because you don't measure yourself at all. We're not equal, we're different. We're not the same. We're equally valuable, we've got equal potential, we've all got Buddha nature, but we're not the same. That's just conceit. So that way, so the Buddha was brilliant, he was saying, don't measure yourself against others at all. You are immeasurable. How can you, you judge yourself against somebody else? It's like in a school, how can you judge a grade 12 children against grade 1 kids? Are the people in grade 12 better than the grade 1 children? Of course not, it's just they've been in school longer, that's all. The kid who comes top of the class, the kid who comes bottom of the class, is the kid who comes top better? than the kid who comes bottom. No, they're equally valuable. This is, again, one of the stories. I'm just going to pause for some water. There's a monk in Thailand, who I think he's passed away now. When I heard his story, it was just such an inspiring story. Because this child, when he went to grade one in his school, after one year, he couldn't pass. He was so unintelligent or so stupid, after one year in grade one, the teacher just with the best one in the world just could not pass him. He flunked grade one. I don't know how you can flunk grade one, maybe you're not good at plasticine, or I don't know what it is, but, or drawing or whatever, but he couldn't pass. So he had to do it again. He repeated grade one. For a second year he failed. And the teacher, no, he's not able to go up to grade two. So they gave him a third try. Three years in grade one, and after the third year, no, he just can't set him up. He didn't pass grade one with three tries. So there's no point in trying again, so they threw him out of school. You know, he was obviously just not competent. And even in the villages in Thailand, the villagers realize if you can't even pass grade one, you probably won't be able to learn how to plow the fields. He's actually useless. So what they did then was most useless people like that in Thailand, they would send them to the monastery and ordain them as a novice. 
It's not all novices become novices because of that. <laughs> but he went to one. <laughs> Sorry about that. I apologize. <laughs> he went to a village monastery. And like most of these monasteries, the monks there, even if in the old days, even though they didn't keep all their rules completely, you know, 100%, they were still very kind and compassionate be people. And the abbot of this monastery just spent so much time and effort with this young man. He really tried even more than any school teacher could to try and teach his kid how to, to read, how to write, how to do simple sums. But the child was just so hopeless. After another few years, even the abbot of the monastery just don't know what to do with the fellow. So as a very, very last resort, he sent them to the forest monastery. Now not all monks who go into a forest monastery <laughs> are like that. He sent them to the forest monastery, this hopeless case, and he went to this forest monastery, the Ajahn there, the teacher, just taught him simple meditation. Just breathing in, board breathing out, toe, toe. That's all. And this young man had such a simple, clear and clean mind. It was the easiest thing in the world to meditate. Butho, butho, butho. He just didn't think. And he soon got into all the jhanas, became one of the great monks of Thailand. It's a wonderful story. So, if you've got a child who's not doing well at school, Send him to my monastery. That can be a great teacher for the future. He may be a great meditator. The point of the story is that if you come top of the class or bottom of the class, it doesn't mean you're better or worse. That is conceit. Everybody has got their value in different ways. I was reading in a newspaper from England that research there has shown one of the highest paid professions in the UK, even you get more money than lawyers, are plumbers. Because everybody's gone to university or going to university these days. Everybody's in IT, in an office, and there's a, there's a terrible shortage of tradespeople, like plumbers. So much so that any plumber, they can quote their own price. And if you've got a leaking tap, or your your plumbing doesn't work in the house, you've got no choice. You have to get the tradesperson in. So in UK, all these plumbers, they drive Mercedes. <laughs> They've got their country houses. They're getting very wealthy. And so the article in the newspaper said, listen, Tony Blair in England is charging all these fees to send your children to university. Don't waste your money sending your kids to university. If you really are concerned with their future, give them an apprenticeship with a plumber. They'll make much more money than if they go to university. You won't have to spend so much on your children's education. You'll just turn, turn them into a plumber. And also, you'll always have someone to come to fix your plumbing, your son. <laughs> and they say, if you care for your kids' education, don't send them to university. Make them into plumbers. <laughs> and the point is that everybody is important in the world, even the plumbers, the bus drivers. When I went to my monastery in Australia the first time, you saw all these dead trees in the forest. And I wanted to, to take them down, because I thought they spoiled the beauty of the forest. But someone told me that those dead trees are important. In the hollows of the dead trees, that's where the possums live. In the hollows of the branches, where the branches have fallen off, that's where the birds nest. So those dead trees are just vital for the habitat of many beings who live in that forest. So take down those dead trees, you'll alter the ecosystem. And when I understood that, I realized that I had judged unfairly. I thought the one tree was better than the next. I didn't realize the value of the dead trees, or the bent trees, or the warped trees. Of course, I soon saw that's like in life. Sometimes we don't value 
people who we think aren't productive, the sick people, the bent people, the warped people. They're important too. In fact, they're vital for our life. Everybody is valuable. So there can't be any judgment now, no conceit left. No better, no worse. No saying this tree is beautiful, that tree is ugly. All trees are beautiful. All people are valuable. That's the end of conceit. Okay, so if you have superpower consciousness, ego conceit disappears. You don't think you're better, you don't think you're worse, you don't even think you're the same. You just don't think in those ways anymore. You don't judge, you don't compare. If you do start comparing and judging, you lose all of your superpower mindfulness. If you get into a jhana, and then you stand up and say, Hey guys, I want all of the meditators here to know I just got into first jhana. You will never get into it again for years. Conceit doesn't work. It blocks progress on the path. Okay? Next question. Oh, we got, I was saying this yesterday. Dear Ajahn, where do you draw the line between illicit sex and non-illicit sex? Two, please give examples. Three, is sex between two singles who are in love but not married illicit? What about casual sex between two singles who are not married? Oh my goodness, I better be careful. <laughs> now of course, when you talk about sex, everybody wakes up. <laughs> Where do you draw the line with illicit sex and non-illicit sex? Oh my goodness, okay, illicit sex and non-illicit sex. If you look at that third precept, it really depends on the time and place. Here on this retreat, all sex is illicit. That's why that I don't like this idea of Mahayana Buddhism, Theravada Buddhism, Zeno Vajrayana, all sex is illicit. <laughs> Come on, S-E-C-T-S, no sects. <laughs> but I think you mean S-E-X here. In, in sex, illicit sex and non-illicit sex, look, you have to go back to the original meaning of virtue. Is it going to hurt or harm somebody? And that's actually the basic rule of virtue which the Buddha gave to his son Rahula in the Rahula Wada Sutta. He said, son Rahula, to contemplate before you speak, before you do, but even before you think anybody, a thing. Here's what I'm about to think, say or do for the harm and benefit of other beings, including myself, or is it for their harm? If it's for their harm, then don't do it. If it's for your harm, don't do it. But if only contemplating, you realize that what you're about to think, to say, to do, is for the benefit and happiness of others, or for yourself, then do it. It's a very beautiful, basic premise where all virtue comes from. It is even more important than the five precepts. So we look at sex, is that going to help or harm or is it going to serve? In your relationship, your husband and wife is part of being married. So you do it compassionately, caringly, so there's your um, intimacy between the two of you. However, if it is not consensual and you force sex on somebody else, obviously that, I would say, that is illicit. Or if it's on somebody who's not competent to give consent, such as someone who's underage, or someone who's a depressed, or somebody who is sort of mentally disturbed for that period of time, again, it's not illicit, it's not real consent. So I would draw the line there. It has to be like consensual, and it also has to be um, you know, consent of a person who is able to give that consent. So if it's underage sex, you know, like uh, elderly people with a young person, certainly no. <coughs> so it's also, they say, with gay sex. Because people ask again, if it's gay sex, you no know, man with man, woman with woman, what's going on there? Again, according to Buddhism, is that going to harm or hurt someone? Or is it going to be for their well-being? And of course, I've uh, looked at some of the, my disciples who are gay, 
and they're wonderful people. They are serving the community, they're great Buddhists, they keep their precepts, they look after everybody, they're compassionate, they meditate. And having looked at that, I cannot see anything wrong with gay relationships, with lesbian relationships, as long as they are committed and they're caring. In fact, I said this, I think, in an interview, I would put much, uh, I would compliment, I would acknowledge and I would praise like a gay relationship where the, the two men are committed to each other and caring to each other, I'd say you guys are much better than a husband who goes playing around with somebody else when they're married. Of the two, the one making the worst karma is a man who's got a wife who goes and has a, a mistress. That is illicit, that is wrong. The two gay people, lesbian couple, having a committed relationship, you're doing much better. So it's not whether it's heterosexual or homosexual sex, it's how you're doing it is the problem. So that's what illicit sex and non-illicit sex. Is sex between two singles who are in love but not married illicit? No, it's not, as long as it's consensual, as long as you have a relationship together. But look, is it going to harm or hurt the other person? It has to be consensual, the right time, the right place, with a bit of love, rather than just for lust. And what about casual sex between two singles who are not married? Again, if we say, no, it's terrible, it's bad, we're overemphasizing the act. There's many, many worse things people do than, you know, you find a nice p partner, you have lust, you know, you're both consensual, you're both in your right mind. And you decide, yes, you have got no other partners. Obviously, you've got to look at the consequences, make sure you, know, you have the uh, condoms or the uh, contraceptives beforehand. Because sometimes casual sex, if you're not prepared, you end up with babies and that's huge problems. And that's why sometimes people have the problem with abortion, simply because they weren't prepared. And there's all these terrible things in abortions. It's not an easy thing to decide upon. Either way, the woman who's pregnant has to suffer. The man can walk away. Not always, because, but the woman is really suffering from that. So you have to be very caring and careful. So that's actually how you make those decisions. You have to figure out for yourself, is it going to harm or hurt someone? Or is it going to create happiness and well-being. Now you have to make that decision. You are human beings with lust. You're not monks. You're not sort of no vices. You have vices. <laughs> you have to acknowledge those. The worst thing is that a monk can come up and say, no, you should all live like monks. You should all be celibate. You should all let go of all these things. And of course, all that means is you don't go to the temple anymore. You think, oh, these monks, they don't give advice which we can actually make use of in our life. You will have sex. I remember reading an article, someone asked Groucho Marx, now one of the Marx brothers, the comedians, <coughs> many years ago, they asked Groucho Marx, what do you think about sex? And he said, I think that sex is here to stay. <laughs> <laughs> so whether, <laughs> whether you want to or not, your kids will have sex you will have sex. So let's actually be compassionate like the Buddha, be realistic, and let's make sure that the sex is not harmful. See of all the dangers which can happen there, and let's make sure we avoid those dangers. And let's make sure that, you know, contraceptives, consensual, be careful of the consequences. If you're in a relationship, keep it within a relationship, not outside. Some years ago, when first year in my monastery in Thailand, there was the, the head teacher of the local school. And when it comes actually to people with um, status in the community, he was way up there, almost next to the monks and the headman of the village. He was a teacher. And he'd been in that school for many years. Everybody in that village had gone through him. So he was highly respected. And he would go to the brothel once a week. And people would actually say, you're breaking your precepts. And he would say, no, I'm not. And actually, he talked to us about that. And after consideration, we thought, hey, he's right. 
Because what had happened, he had a wife, but his wife, I'm not sure if it was some disease or what happened to her, was mentally incapacitated. All she could do was just basically lie around the house. She couldn't cook, she couldn't work. All she could do was just basically lie around the house. She couldn't cook, she couldn't work. And he, as a teacher, supported her. And he said, look, I'm not a monk. I'm keeping my five precepts, but my wife cannot satisfy me sexually. She can't do that act at all. She's completely incapacitated. He said, I'm a man. I need sort of my sexual whatever it is. And so once a week, if my, ma my wife can't serve me, I go to the bottle for once a week. He said, that's not breaking the precepts. And when you thought about it, I thought, yeah, he's actually is correct. Because it wasn't, he was not being unfaithful to his wife. In fact, he was being the most caring, devoted husband you could possibly have. His wife just was incapacitated because of mental illness. In that case, I thought, okay, that's a one case, I think you're right. So we look upon these issues, not in black and white, get all the information, and is it really helping or harming? We find out which one it is and act accordingly. Does that make sense? Any questions on that? Yeah. Correct, that's one thing you also have to look out for, sexually transmitted diseases. And obviously that if you have a, a, a partner you're committed to, they're committed to you and you're committed to them. Actually you know where you stand in that area. It's one of the very, very dangerous things about sex these days. It doesn't come without a price tag. And some of that, sometimes that price tag is your life. So you've got to be careful. Yeah? <laughs> oral sex is not sex. Someone asked, what's oral sex? And they thought, just talking about it. <laughs> yeah, of course it's sex. It's a sexual act. People get excited. And it has many of the attributes of the sexual act. So, yeah, I mean, it's just where you draw the line and that's... You can say that's sex. Okay, but <laughs> all the sex is talking about. I like that line when I read that. <laughs> Dear Ajahn, reincarnation. I read a senior lama reincarnated into two persons. Please explain. That's called schizophrenia. <laughs> two. <laughs> Split personality, isn't it? That's what I thought. No, it's impossible. You only go one to one. People who say otherwise, they don't know the stream of consciousness and how it works. Please explain, chanting gains merit. Why? I thought good deeds gain merit. And chanting is a good deed because if you chant with mindfulness and devotion, you're thinking about the object of your chanting, the Buddha, the Dhamma, the Sangha. Even thinking about these things is great, good merit. That's why it's good merit. However, if you chant just like a parrot. Iti piso bhagawa arahang samma sambuddha When is this going to finish? I want to get back to meditate. <laughs> if it's with ill will, you've not got your heart into it, it's no merit at all. But eh, it's like, have you seen these little um, things they have with the Amitabha chanting? They chant 24 hours a day with the batteries. See those? Do you think that those machines make merit? <laughs> that in their next life they'll be reborn as like computers or even mainframes? <laughs> Perfect chanting. No, that's just a machine. <laughs> Machines don't make merit, but if you act like a machine, you don't make merit either. So you have to put your heart into the chant. You have to feel it, think it. Chant from your, I was going to say chant from your soul, but chant from your non-self is much better. <laughs> Put passion into your chanting. Compassion. 
Ajahn, a few days ago you mentioned three types of nodding. Can you please repeat them as I have been nodding so much that I need to know which category I fall into? <laughs> What was I saying? I think I think only mentioned the two types of nodding. I think you must have been asleep and you must have dreamt the third type. <laughs> I think this, I think sometimes nodding is like sleepiness. It's just the body doing the nodding. The other type of nodding, it's not really nodding, but the, the chi in the body is moving your body backwards and forwards. Actually, there was a third type, I remember it now. The chi in the body, it's just, I've mentioned this to many people, when you get peaceful and calm, the body can actually heal itself and sometimes to heal itself for the energies to flow you have to move to the left or move to the right. Parts of your body get hot or you know, things start vibrating and shaking. That is just the chi, the energy flowing in the body. Leave it alone, you'll feel great afterwards. I think the third type of nodding is actually when you get pity, like a shaking with beautiful bliss. Pity is like energy, the bliss which comes in deep meditation. Sometimes you shake like that. So those are the three types of nodding. So you can find out which one is yours. I know which one it is. <laughs> Next question. I have seen on some occasions some people whilst chanting going into a fit like ecstasy, often jerking themselves uncontrollably and making strange gurgling noises. <laughs> My goodness. <laughs> Should we wake such people up or leave them alone? Why do they behave like this? Are these self-induced? Thank you. Okay, sometimes that people do go a little bit crazy. If they're like schizophrenic especially, if they sort of start to hear voices and stuff like that, they chant and get so inspired, the energy might go in the wrong places. Most of you haven't got that problem at all. So most people when they're chanting don't go into trances, especially if you're mindful, you're alert, you're watching what you're doing. So be careful. Sometimes people are chanting in the morning when we first get up and they forget to stop. You know, you sort of start, Itipiso Bhagawa Arahang, Buddhang Abhipujayami, then you go straight away into Suwakato Bhagawa Tadamo, you forget to bow because you're just going on automatic pilot. Sometimes that happens. People keep on doing the, the eight precepts, Parnati Pata, where Ramani, and they get to Ucha Sayana Maha Sayana, where Ramani Sikapadang Samadhi Ami, they keep on going, Parnati Pata, where Ramani Sikapadang Samadhi Ami, Adi Nadana Rava. They forget to, because they're not mindful. So be mindful. Be alert when you're chanting. And you don't go into a trance. So usually there's no problem there. But if you do see someone who goes into those trance, then you just tell them, be mindful next time, be alert. The chanting is there for a purpose, to bring up this energy of devotion to the Buddha, Dharma and the Sangha. The Buddha is the peaceful one. The Buddha never danced. The Sangha never threw their arms up all over the place. So out of respect for the Buddha, Dharma and the Sangha, shh, you body become. Dear Ajahn, do Buddhas and Arahats still exist in the realm of perception and non-perception as Ajahn Man was said to be preached by them during his stri strive, striving for enlightenment? The answer is that these were nimitas, these were visions which came up, these weren't real Arahats. Remember what I was saying about when you leave your body and you see this beautiful light and you add what you expect to be there, whether it's a Virgin Mary or Uncle George, remember that simile yesterday? This is what happens in nimitas, nimitas come up in the mind and you make them into arahats, but you're not really arahats, you know that. It's just the way you interpret the message. You're just seeing the Dhamma. And the Dhamma, you give it a body, just to sort of make it more intelligible. But it's the Dhamma you're seeing. When the arahats are arahats, they're gone, no longer around. They say that again and again, this is my last life, there's no more of this. They disappear, no longer to be seen. But the Dhamma still exists. So what Ajahn Man then, he was seeing the Dhamma, not the people. Is it alright to be, uh, is it alright to be attached to triple gems? So much that I dreamt of Ajahn so many times. Ah, <laughs> oh, isn't that nice? <laughs> yes, you can be attached to the triple gem. The Buddha said this triple gem, the Eightfold Path, is like a raft which takes you from one shore to the next shore. If you are travelling in the raft of the Eightfold Path, it is good, wise policy to
to be attached to that raft, especially when you are in midstream. You can let go of the raft when you're on Arahat, but please do not let go of it before then. Otherwise, you will come to grief and drown. <laughs> so attach to your precepts, attach to meditation, attach to wisdom, attach to your teachers, attach to jhanas, attach to mindfulness, until you can say, I'm an arahat. When you can say that, then you can let go of them, but you find you can't anyway because that's you. You become the path. The point is that some people say, oh, attachment is bad, I've got to let go of everything. They let go of their precepts, first of all, they let go of the things which, you know, not the things which are good for them, the things which are bad for them. They keep those, they let go of the good things. They let go of their precepts, they let go of their meditation, let go, let go, let go. So I'm going to just watch the television and let go. I'm going to eat as much as I can, let go. I'm not attached to my figure. I'm not attached to my health. I'm not attached to my job. That's stupid stuff. So, <laughs> if you have a vehicle, you've got to be attached to it. You can't let go midstream. So, you attach to the raft until you've taken you across. Then you can let go. So, be attached to the triple gem. In Vajrayana, my friend told me his teacher is the Dharmakaya of Maitreya Buddha. His teacher has a lot of disciples and tells his experience of psychic powers and claim many have gone to hell criticizing him. Comment please. If anyone criticizes me, I forgive you straight away. I've already told you this. I forgive you in the past, in the present and in the future. So you can criticize me tomorrow, know you've already been forgiven. I give you credit forgiveness. <laughs> you have unlimited credit to criticize me as much as you like and I'll always forgive you. So that way you can never go to hell for criticizing me. Isn't that wonderful? So the trouble is, when I hear that, I'm not sure who the teacher is, but I say, well, if you believe in me you go to heaven, if you criticize me you go to hell. That sounds like a, one of the cults to me. That's actually true, because a good teacher would never say that. They'd say, no, you can actually go to heaven you believe in me or you don't. You believe in the Dhamma, the truth, not in me. Ajahn Brahm is just a bundle of five candors. That's all he is. He eats baked beans and mashed potatoes in the morning because I was born in England. It's not my fault. My genes. <laughs> so that way, you don't worship the person. You worship the Dhamma. So it could be that your friend is the Dharmakaya of Maitreya Buddha. It's not Maitreya Buddha, just the Buddha is the Buddha is the Buddha. So if you're the Dharma of the Buddha, then actually that's your teachings. The teachings are the main thing. So you worship the teachings, you never worship the person. And that's why the people said, this was a problem with Wakali, one of the Buddha's disciples, who had so much faith in the Buddha, just wanted to follow him around, just to look at him all day. You're just, just gazing at the Buddha, or just had so much happiness looking at the face of the Buddha. And after a while the Buddha said, look, Wakali, you didn't become a monk to be attached to this old body which is stinking, which is falling apart. It's to the Dhamma. And that was the Buddha who told Wakali, he who sees the Dhamma sees the Buddha, Wakali. That's who the Buddha is, the Dhamma, not this body. And eventually Wakali understood, became an Arahant. So, it's not the teacher you worship, it's the Dhamma. And no teacher has a franchise on the Dhamma. You can't patent the Four Noble Truths and say, I am the only one who can teach this. You have to learn it from me. I am the only way. You can't get the franchise. The truth is like the air. People can bottle it and try and sell it, but that's being stupid because the air is all around you. It was found recently in the UK, this company, I think it was a subsidiary of Coca-Cola, was selling this bottled water until they found out it was literally taken from the taps of the Thames Valley Water Authority, put in a bottle and sold as spring water. Coca-Cola was doing this. <laughs> 
It was from the tap, my goodness, but they were putting it in a bottle and selling it. That's like some religious teachers. The truth is the air, it's there for you to breathe. I don't own the truth. Find it out for yourself. I'm trying to get rid of disciples, not gain more. So you can criticize me as much as you like. Please go for it and leave me alone. <laughs> so that's the problem there. Sometimes it sounds like if you tell your experience of psychic powers, good monks don't tell about their psychic powers. And the reason why is because they don't want to gain more disciples. It's not just a marketing ploy. Sometimes that's what it is. I tell you all my psychic powers. My goodness, Ajahn Brahm's got psychic powers. Our teacher is better than your teacher. Nah, 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 nah. <laughs> <laughs> so we don't do that. We don't compare. It's no pride. There's no conceit about a teacher, one teacher being better than another. There's no conceit about Mahayana being better than Theravada or Theravada being more original than Mahayana or Vajrayana being the best teaching. That's conceit. No one has got a franchise on the truth. It's free for everybody. Does that make sense? Okay. Dear Ajahn, I have two questions please. Question one, should we communicate with the mind when it is in a steady peaceful state? I mentioned that just the first thing this morning. If it's a steady, peaceful state, you can give it a couple of hints, but no more than that. If it's really peaceful, don't give any nudges at all. If you get into nimitta stages, don't even try to nudge the mind. If you try that, very often it all falls apart. But in the early stages of the meditation, you can nudge it a little bit. Give a couple of orders to your taxi driver and it works. How do we get the peaceful mind to be back in the normal state quicker when coming out of meditation? Look, it's so hard to get the peaceful mind. Try and get the peaceful mind back to the normal state slower. <laughs> Enjoy it as long as you like. <laughs> However, if you're out there in the world and you're meditating, you get very, very peaceful. you just got to ease yourself back into normal consciousness. It takes a while. Sometimes you've got no choice of the matter. I tell the story when I was did my six months silent retreat. Imagine how quiet and peaceful I got for six months. Never saw anybody or spoke to anybody. And then as soon as I finished my six months retreat, everybody wanted to find out what I was up to. What did you do? What did you see? <laughs> and so people started talking to me and it was just so hard. I had a headache for three days because I had to get my mind moving again. I had to start thinking and it was just so hard. So I forced myself to start thinking again and start speaking, because I had to. And that's why it gave me a headache. It would be much better actually to take it over a whole week or something. Next time I do that, I give myself like maybe a week to come out. The calmer you are, the more peaceful you are, the longer it takes, obviously. So you just um, allow it to happen naturally. Do you imagine I have heard from Christian friends that Christian preachers and spiritual healers have been able to heal the sick? If there's no creator God, where do they get the powers from to heal the sick? Why is it that the Buddhist monks with great powers do not heal the sick? Of course we heal the sick. My goodness, we do all this chanting. Many people actually get healed much better by Buddhist monks. Is it not an act of compassion to heal the sick if they're able to do so? Please enlighten us on this. I have healed many sick people in my life. Continue to do so. If anybody has any doubts about this, let's come back to science. There was an experiment done in USA. It was in, I, I did have this quote, I think it's in the Journal of uh, something psychiatry in December 1998. It was a, uh, a, 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 an experiment which was done in many hospitals in the US to see the effect of distant healing, either chanting or praying. It was a brilliant experiment. They wanted to find out whether this praying healing business actually works. And so they got Buddhist monks, they got Christian priests, they got Jewish rabbis and indigenous Indians, you know, Red Indians, the shamans. They gave them a list of names. Half the names were fake, just made up. Half the names were patients in the hospitals of California suffering from AIDS. Those uh, patients who were, had AIDS, half of them were on the list, half of them weren't. And they did not know that they were being prayed 
on or chanted for. It wasn't just Christians, it wasn't just Buddhists, it was Jewish rabbis and even indigenous Indians. And they gave the doctors in his hospitals a very simple questionnaire, a questionnaire over the two weeks or month of chanting or praying, whatever else the, the religion did to heal their sick. The questionnaire was, in those two weeks, is that particular chanting or praying, whatever else the, the religion did to heal their sick. The questionnaire was, in those two weeks, is that particular patient, have they improved more than expected, as expected, or worse than expected? A very simple question. And of course, you know, that you know, if it's just uh, one person, you know, it's just up to the doctor, they may not be objective enough. But there was hundreds of these patients. And it was very clearly, came very clearly from the statistics, that the people who were being chanted for, being prayed for, actually got much better. More better than expected. It was so significant it got reported in Time magazine. That's where I first saw it and I got the original article off the internet. Chanting, praying works. And the important thing which to tell your Christian brothers is it's not just Christianity. Buddhists do this just as well as do indigenous Indians, as Jewish rabbis. It does not matter which religion you are. Buddhists have their miracles as well. Remember that, I don't know if I told that story about this. Uh, one of my disciples in Perth, his name is George, an old English man, he had cancer of the lungs. He went to the um, specialists, the specialists looked at the x-ray, showed him the x-ray, he said, your lungs are both gone. Cancer is right throughout every part of each lung. This riddled with the cancer. He said, there's no real possibility of doing surgery. We can't take both of your lungs away. He said, the prognosis is not good. We can try radiotherapy or chemotherapy. Miracle might happen, but it's very unlikely. But the, what I can probably say to you, that we can maybe extend your life by three or four months, maybe six months at the most. Go back to your home, talk it over with your wife, with your family, let me know what you wanted to do. That was the prognosis. Basically, he was a goner. So he went back home. He talked it over with his wife. He thought to himself, well, I think I'll just let nature take its course. If I've got to die, let's die. Instead of going through all this radiotherapy and chemotherapy business. So that's what he did. He went back to the specialist two weeks later. They took another x-ray just to see how the disease had progressed. He went into the oncologist's room to just tell him that just let it take its natural course. Don't even try to do anything. I'm ready to die. But when he went into the specialist's room, the specialist was looking at the new x-ray shaking his head. George, so he told me, thought, oh my goodness, it's worse than he thought. So he just asked the specialist, look, tell it to me straight, doctor. How many days have I got? And the doctor looked up at him and said, sir, I'm not shaking my head because it's got worse. I'm shaking my head because it's completely disappeared. Look, I've never seen anything like this before. In two weeks, the cancer had completely vanished. And the doctor looked up and said, what have you been doing? And he said, meditating. <laughs> Carry on, said the doctor. <laughs> now that's a rare case of meditation curing diseases. This is what we do as Buddhists. Don't underplay Buddhism because the Christians go on shouting every time they got a cure. It's a miracle, it's a miracle. We have heaps of miracles here in Buddhism, only we don't shout them out, we don't make a big fuss and bother about them because we're not trying to promote our religion against others. I'm sure that even in Islam, there's heaps of miracles happen. Faith healing happens because it's not the power of a creator God, it's the power of your mind. I know that because I know my mind and just how powerful it can be to heal people. So don't get sucked into people who don't know what they're talking about. You can tell your Christian friends and Christian preachers and spiritual healers 
that our Buddhist monks have also been able to heal people and bring them back from the dead. <laughs> we have. I brought you back from the dead this morning. Four o'clock you were dead. But now you're alive again. <laughs> so the Buddhist monks with great powers do heal the sick. We do our chanting and it works. Many, many people who come to me and said, you're chanting. Sometimes it's just amazing. I really thought that I've been chanting for people that they've been too far gone. The doctors have said they're too far gone, but they're still alive today. It's amazing just the power of chanting. But it has to be done with the power of the mind. You have to concentrate and focus to do the chanting, otherwise it doesn't work. Well, it doesn't work so effectively, but that experiment done in the US is scientific fact. It's not just Christians, it's not just Buddhists, it's all people. Do you imagine if I lose my nimitta the first time I encountered it, will it appear again? How long do I have to wait before that happens? When you stop asking questions like this, it will come back. <laughs> the more you want it, the further it goes away. So you just, it's like you want some, a friend to come round for tea, to come round for lunch. You can't just get them on the street and drag them in. To get your best friend coming down for lunch, you've got to make your house just so tidy, so inviting. You've got to put out a nice feast on the table. And if your house is so inviting, you've got great food in there, your friend will come by themselves. You don't need to even ring them up. They will come in because you've got a lovely house with beautiful food. In that simile, your house is your mind. You've got to make it pure by keeping your precepts. You've got to make it have beautiful food, the joy and the happiness, the peace and contentment inside of you. If you have your good precepts, you have peace, you have contentment, then Jaya is going to go right into your door. You don't need to ask it to come in. The nimitas are going to be knocking on your door, just trying to force a way in. Because you've got such a lovely mind. That's why they want to come. They will only come in when you're at peace, when you've got contentment, when you're still. If they look and see you're not stood enough yet, you're not content yet, you're not peaceful, they're going to go next door to the meditator sitting next to you. <laughs> <laughs> How often can one go into the deep states of jhanas? Can an advanced meditator go into such states at will or is it a hit or miss affair? Also you mentioned that a person is oblivious to the surrounding, surrounding around when in such deep states. How can one be sure to wake up? Okay, if you're a very advanced meditator, it's very easy to go to those states. It's a case of, is, is at will, without difficulty. That's actually what the suttas say, that's what it is. But really the best way is if you're either an anagami or an arahat, and then there's no difficulties, because you're not skilled just in actually getting into jhana, you're skilled at getting rid of the obstacles to jhana. And this is an important point. The skill is not saying, I want to get into jhana, come on, go in. Your skill is in getting rid of the obstacles to jhana. So there's nothing between you and the jhana, so you can just go in easily. Your job is to clear the path of all the hindrances, all the wanting, all the ill will, and then jhana just happens. Now you understand why it's easy for enlightened beings to get into jhanas. There's no problem, no obstacle anymore. They're just so peaceful and content. If there's nothing to do, they do nothing. Just go into deep meditation. Next question. My sister was in depression for about half a year. Even seeing a psychologist being on medication didn't seem to work for her. I went on a meta-meditation meta retreat and for a few days she was the object of my meta. During the interview on the meta retreat, the Venerable told me that I would not be able to help my sister overcome her depression by sending meta to her unless my meta was very powerful. I stopped sending letters to my sister after that and radiated loving kindness to all beings instead. However, I shared all my merits during the eight-day meta retreat with my sister. I was pleasantly surprised when I went home to find my sister cheerful, no longer depressed, and she's now on the road to recovery. My question is, can meta help a third party overcome depression or is it the sharing of merits that works? Thank you. It's actually probably the meta was more strong, but when you're sharing merits, that's an expression of meta. An expression of love is giving. That's why on Buddhist Day or Mithras Day or Maitreya Day people give each other presents. And why is that? Because it's an expression of love. 
So sharing of merits is an expression of love to one's departed relations or in that particular case, you know, your sister. So you were doing metta by sharing merits. It's just one way of doing metta. And she obviously received it. Well done. You can share merits with a third party because it's a way of having metta towards them. You're thinking about them. And just in that experiment done in the US hospitals, if you share merit with another person, even if they don't know it's happening, even if it's a Christian and it's a Buddhist who is sending the metta, they still receive it. It affects them. Next question. If the clarity and brightness of a nimitta depends on the virtues of a meditator, what would be the nature of the nimitta for a criminal who have repented and is leaving a virtuous life now? Would it be bright because he's very virtuous now, or would it be dull due to its being tainted by his past wrongdoings? If you've been working in the garden yesterday, but you've had a shower now, what will you look like? You will look clean and sparkling. And that's why that if you've recently done virtuous acts, your nimitta will be virtuous. Your mind changes in all moments. It's like some time ago, I was in my monastery in Australia, and I was working very hard. We were mixing concrete to make one of the buildings. And even though I'm the abbot, I still work with everybody else. Just because I'm the boss doesn't mean I can't get my hands dirty. And that's actually great for the bosses to pitch in when there's something needs to be done. So you don't feel that you're somehow superior than your youngest of novices. So we're all mixing the concrete. And of course, if you ever mix cement and concrete, you get this grey smears all over you. When you put the cement into the cement mixer, some of it goes all over the place. Some of it times the, the concrete is a bit too wet and it splashes everywhere. So my face was uh, blotched with like cement stains and my robes, under robes, were all dirty. And as I went to the hall, I was going to the hall to go and get washed and changed, there was a Sri Lankan woman come. She was obviously quite a wealthy person because she was very well dressed. And she would come to visit the monastery for the first time. And she came to see me and she said, um, I'd like to see the abbot, where is he? <laughs> so thinking quickly, I said, if you go up to the hall there, he should be there. If he's not there now, he'll be there in a few minutes. <laughs> <laughs> so I quickly went to my room, had a quick shower, very quick, quickly got dressed in my proper robes, clean robes, went up there and uh, said hello to her. And she sort of expressed her admiration of the monastery heard my name before, glad to meet me. But just before she left, she said, if you don't mind me saying this, Ajahn Brahm, but some of your monks are not properly dressed. I saw this monk up there, he looked so dirty. Please, you must tell him. I said, oh yeah, I'll tell him, I'll tell him. <laughs> I laughed. <laughs> Which one is the right Ajahn Brahm? Neither of them are the right Ajahn Brahm, but a few moments ago I looked very dirty and then I had a shower looked very clean. Just like your nimitta, the nimitta of a criminal. Just after they've done the crime can be very dirty. But afterwards it can change straight away. That's why Angulibada can get into enlightenment. Please explain child prodigy. Is it that some children were born smarter than others because of the development of the nimittas over the past lives? It's because of your past life karma. If you've you might be playing music in your past life, you're a prodigy and you can actually remember that music. Having gone to a place like Cambridge, there were a few child prodigies there I, kn I knew. There's this one guy who's a brilliant in mathematics. You know like sometimes people are mathematical prodigies? And he'd, f he'd actually got an external degree from London even before he went up to Cambridge. You know, he'd already done all the work. And I, th I thought at the time, not actually knowing what prodigies were like, I thought, wow, this guy's going to be an absolute genius. You know, later on he's going to go so high, he's going to be this great professor, maybe make amazing discoveries. But what happened? He got to that level of like you know, a bachelor's and he couldn't go any further. I think he, he may have done an MA, he may have done a doctorate, but he was just ordinary from that time on. It's as if, <coughs> it's as if what you've learned in your past life you get to that level extremely quickly. But that's the only level you get to. Now you've got to work like everybody else. So prodigies are like that. Most prodigies, you know, they know when they're about 13 or 14, you know what a 21 year old should know. But then they don't progress from there. 
or they just progress ordinarily. So prodigies are like that. At young, they look like they're full of promise, but they don't fulfill that promise in their later years. What's actually happening there is that they remember what they've learned before. No more than what they've learned before, just that amount. They get to that level very quickly, and now they've got to learn like everybody else. That's what a prodigy is. People who can recall their past lives, not explicitly, but implicitly. In other words, psychologically. Any questions on that one? Okay, I'm going to go through another couple of questions because I'm going over the time, but I want to finish the questions. What is the difference between rebirth and reincarnation? I had this question the other day. It's only this spelling, that's all. Sometimes people are pedantic. Can they say, oh, you can't say reincarnation because that means there's a soul who's incarnated into a new body. But you can say, because it's a stream of consciousness, that's what the Buddha said, incarnated. It's not a being incarnated, it's a stream of consciousness. So rebirth and reincarnation, I use both words, um, what's it called, uh, interchangeably. So it's okay to call it rebirth or reincarnation. And if you don't believe in reincarnation in this life, you would in your next. It's a joke. We have that on a t-shirt in Perth. Don't worry, I never believed in reincarnation in my last life either. <laughs> One, can walking meditation lead to enlightenment? Yes, it can. You can get into enlightenment while you're walking. Many great monks have become enlightened while they're walking, especially when they do, I will die, that's for sure. I will die, that's for sure. I will die, that's for sure. Please try that, it's really good fun. Does our degree of attainment in meditation practices vary with age? Okay, when you get older, sometimes you don't think so much, but then you haven't got as much energy as your youth. So there's some aspects of your, your indriyas, your powers, some get less, some get more. So basically it's all the same. It's not whether what changes when you get old age, it's how you make use of it when you get old. So old age can be a benefit. Sure, you can't sort of move around as, as evenly or as easily as you could when you were young, but your mind has got less lust, I hope. <laughs> and number two, <laughs> sort of, you know, you've got a bit more wisdom. You don't think so much the older you get. Because a lot of times, the older you get, the you start losing your neurons. The brain cells actually start to die. In fact, I read it in the, in the uh, medical journal, I think we're about 23, 24, you've got your maximum number of brain cells. After that time, you start losing them. So after about 23, 24, you go over the hill. <laughs> Some of you are well over the hill, actually most of you. <laughs> so you don't think so much, but you're wiser. If suddenly we are frozen in jhana in an untimely condition, can we get defrost to get along with our lives? <laughs> no, unfortunately, you can't defrost. But someone actually asked me that in the question. I didn't answer it. You can program your mindfulness. You can say, if, if you think you're going to get into a jhana, or if you get those jhanas regularly, you can tell yourself before you go in, but not while you're in. It has to be done before. I will stay in for a certain time. If you don't want to miss your lunch, what is it? It's uh, almost 20 to 10 now. You get into a jhana and say, I must come out by 11 o'clock. I must come out for 11 o'clock. Oh, it's 11.30, isn't it? I must come out by 11.30 for lunch. And you'll find you will come out. You can't defrost, you can't push the defrost button while you're inside, but you can actually program when you're going to defrost, before you go in. And third question, upon death the five senses will be cut off and the mind meets with nimitta. Does this mean a sure way to nibbana? No. Sometimes you meet with a nimitta, you don't know what to do with it. And the whole thing just falls apart. Just like now when you get a nimitta, sometimes it all falls apart. Because you don't know how to deal with it. So sure, everybody will meet, will see a nimitta when they die, but not everyone gets enlightened, obviously. It's how you deal with it is important. If metta meditation can get us to jhana, how do we store the mind if we keep thinking of people to direct metta to? What happens in loving kindness meditation, you've heard me teach this in the mornings, you start focusing on the feeling of metta. It's called disembodied metta. 
So it's not, you use the people to actually the objects to get the meta going, the fire. You notice after a while, you can't see the fuel in a fire. You can't see the logs or the coal, you can just see the blazing flames. That's what metta meditation is like. After a while it gets so strong, all you can see is the metta. You can't see the people you're directing the metta to. That's just the fuel which gets the fire going. So after a while you get this beautiful feeling of golden light inside of your mind. It's the, the feeling of metta, it's the nimitta of metta. And that sort of golden ball of light, this is why I've been encouraging to view metta in that way, it gets so strong that that becomes a nimitta. The golden ball of metta. Just puts itself right in front of your mind. It's so joyful, it's so brilliant, it's so beautiful. You don't think of people anymore. The thoughts of people have done their job. Just like the breath has done its job when you let it go to see the nimitta. And from there you've got this beautiful metta nimitta. And from there you go into the jhanas. That's where the paths all come together. That's how you do metta jhanas. In fact there's no difference between the jhana arrived at through metta or the jhana arrived through with breath meditation. You get to the nimitta, the five senses dull down till they disappear. The mind gets very bright. In this particular case, it's empowered by loving kindness, by selflessness. It's so beautiful and so bright. You soon get into jhanas. If you get that nimitta through metta, that is a powerful nimitta. And it's pretty easy to get into jhanas from the metta nimitta. The next last question, I would have finished them today, even though I've gone on for the next ten minutes. On the third morning after breakfast, I meditated at the main shrine hall and lost track of time. When I came down to the meditation hall, the questions and answers session had already started. Your voice could be heard clearly, but I could not see Ajahn at all. Is this a recording, I thought? I looked at your assistance on the right side of the stage, and he was there. Where is Ajahn? Is he sick? I looked the second time, and you were there. What a relief. The case of the disappearing Ajahn. <laughs> Sometimes when you talk, your face and shoulder appear with a whitish bone color, something similar to ash color. Besides this change, your face will also appear to be like someone else. Once you had Roman features on your face, there are other looks as well, even when I had my glasses on. Maybe you should go to the optician and change your prescription. <laughs> No, I'm only saying that, that's not true. There are other looks as well when I had my glasses on. Are these delusions or are these your previous lives? Mm. Now it's actually true, what happens when you're listening to Dhamma, this is actually what happens, you get inspired, especially if you just had a good meditation up in that hall, you get very peaceful. Perception starts to play tricks on you. It's not really tricks, it's actually real things. Your perception starts to get very strong. I've called this, and you've heard me say this before, it's like your perception grows wings, it gets them freedom. Part of the joy of a meditator is to play with perception, which means that you can see things you're not supposed to see. Your perceptions have been so conditioned and trained, what I was saying last night about will, you don't realize how much you have been conditioned. You've been trained to see things in a certain way. That's what happened at school. Monk, flower, sort of Buddha. And actually you believe the word so much, you stop looking at the thing. And the thing has got a myriad, a huge infinite number of ways you can look at them. Once you get into deep meditation, you're actually getting beyond all that conditioning. You're letting it go. So you can see the Buddha as something completely different than you've ever seen before. Sometimes you can see Ajahn Brahm without a head. Sometimes you can see him as a ball of light, sometimes completely disappearing. You can see the person sitting next to you doing that as well. You can see the wall just melt, shimmer, you can see the floor just be waves and just completely vanish underneath you. Perception can do that. At first you're scared. Am I going crazy? You're not going crazy, it's just what happens when you get into deep meditation. When your mind becomes empowered, it's not blinkered anymore. It's not constrained by seeing things in the same old way. 
don't know if I mentioned this in the talks, but I certainly mentioned this in one of the interviews, that one of the first times that this happened to me was when I was in a monastery in the north of Thailand. I passed a washing area and I saw a towel on the line drying. It was jet black. And I just rubbed my eyes. Am I imagining that? Because I'd never seen a black towel before. Pink towels, red towels, purple towels, yellow towels, white towels, but never a black towel. And I looked at that, and I met, no, it was black. It was really a black towel. I looked at it for a couple of minutes. <coughs> then I was looking at it, and then it turned into white again. That's weird. And I went out to it, it was a white towel. But for about three or four minutes, I stared at it with full mindfulness, and it looked black. And now I realized what was going on. It's just perception, that's all. Perception can actually see white things being black. And I read that in the suttas later on, that sort of meditating monks, at night time, they can look upon night time as it's perfectly bright. They can look, look upon the daytime as it's completely dark. The mind can do that, and it's not that hard to do. When your mind gets powerful, free from the hindrances, you can see things in really strange and weird ways. It's just the mind freeing its perception. So perception can actually do things it's not supposed to do, not trained to do. And it shows you just how much you're limited with the way you perceive things. Once you start to do that, as a monk, if you see a beautiful girl, you can look upon her as ugly, very easily. The most ugliest demon. See this supermodel? Ugh, yuck, she looks ugly. You can see this poor ugly person and see them as beautiful. Things you hate, you can see their Buddha nature in straight away, the most wonderful, beautiful, kind person. So if an enemy comes up with, to you with a knife, you can just perceive them as just this, this Bodhisattva, this beautiful being. It's a strange thing if you perceive them like that, when they become that, they put down their knife. It's how you can actually be invulnerable to people hurting you. But if you see sort of a, a friend or that, uh, you see anything. Your perception can actually just do whatever it wants. And that way you can train perception. Even in the worst of meditation states, you can see it's just ultimate beauty. You can manufacture an imitator just like that, so easy. Because you trained your perception. So this is actually what happens. Now, what you saw there was a very good sign it shows you your perception is becoming free from its constraints of conditioning. Your mind is getting strong. Keep on going. You can have a lot of fun. And my perception is showing me that it's time for the interviews. I can't see it's quarter to ten. It's now minutes to now. So it is time for, <laughs> time for interviews. So those of you who want to come to the interviews, please come up for interviews. We've got another day and a half. There will be interviews tomorrow morning as well. So, don't worry, there is time for everybody, because in now time, there's all the time in the world. So, please enjoy now time on now day, and I will see you later on sometime, somewhere, but it will always be now. Have a happy meditate. Hopefully that you will become enlightened this morning. Who knows? Thank you.